Thanks for tuning in today. I'm John Holmes, the owner of Holmes Hobbies, and we're going to do video two on the history of Holmes Hobbies. We shot a video a couple of weeks back covering the history of Holmes Hobbies and pretty much why we are, who we are, and how we got here today. And I realized that I'd completely missed covering any of my machines, our manufacturing capabilities, and really the core reason why we are here today. And that's that we make motors and that I design and manufacture to some part the motors. And uh, so I figured I'd do a video covering just really my progression in machines. So let's, uh, I had to make a list because there's enough of them that I, it was kind of hard to keep them straight. But uh, starting out before I even started Holmes Hobbies, I got a little Sherline mill with a rotary table. And that was, I think, about 2002 or 2003. I had just gotten into rock crawling and wanted to build little parts for myself. And that was by far the easiest way to do it. And so I got myself a little Sherline and it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot on that little machine, but they're pretty flexible. They're not good for production use or anything. So I ended up selling it down the road after I'd already bought another mill. But at any rate, it was just good learning experience, kind of getting my feet wet being a machinist there. So after getting that guy, starting the business, and then getting into motors pretty much immediately, 2005, I got into motors, I bought a Logan lathe, and that was, uh, I think, 2006. It's a Logan 12x24, it's kind of an old school US iron lathe, pretty big guy. Uh, moved it mostly by myself using rollers, uh, just steel rollers on the ground and pushing it. I did have one guy help me for the final little pull uh, because some rain was coming and I, I was just wore so far out. Called a friend in, was like, hey man, help me push this thing. We ended up pulling it into my basement at my home. And what I used it for originally was turning down motor shafts. Uh, because when we were doing the outrunners, uh, we really couldn't get enough volume going for a manufacturer to say, hey, you know, we'll make what you want so I can design stuff, but nobody would make it for me. Uh, buying 100 motors at a time, there's not many manufacturers that'll do custom work for you. So what I did is I would press all the shafts out of the outrunners, I would throw them into the lathe in a collet chuck, and then turn them down to an eighth inch so they'll accept a normal pinion. Because at the time, uh, five millimeter pinions just were basically mod one and that was about it maybe mod 0.8 for some of the helicopters but there was practically no options in the pitch that we needed for a rock crawler in five millimeter style pinions so what, what i needed to do was turn down the shafts and that's what we did in fairly short order it ended up paying for itself uh, which was cool uh, that was kind of the purpose of it was to do work that would pay for the machine. I think that's what all machinists want is to be able to pay for their machines with the work that they do and, and hopefully pay themselves. But it also enabled us to just modify motors and do some more housing work and also prototype work for myself. And so it was kind of like a jumping point to get used to more machining, lathe machining instead of mill machining, a little bit different skill set, and get myself comfortable with having a big lathe that's kind of you know scary and a lot of mass uh, turning around there. Yeah, just to have good habits. It's always good to have good habits around a machine like that. You know, no long hair dangling and no shirts dangling to get caught, stuff like that. So next machine, uh, what I got was a spoke machine. About 2009, 2010, I got a spoke machine, a Morizumi. And this was because I, I really like bikes. I'm obviously sitting on a scooter. I really like two wheeled machines. I have a lot of 50cc bikes. I have a lot of bicycles. Uh, I'm, think that I'm under 25 bicycles right now in my life. I think, uh, at least I hope that I am. I haven't counted them in a while, but I have a lot of little bikes like this. Obviously the electric motorcycle, the Suron, I've been doing videos of that. So I, I really like bikes. And a big part of that is wheel building. I've been building my own wheels since I was 13, I do believe. Been building my own bikes since part of that. But when you're wheel building, it's kind of tough to get the right spokes. And in particular, I wanted to use 12 gauge spokes to mate bicycle rims, or I'm sorry, uh, bicycle hubs with lightweight motorcycle rims. And nobody was doing that at the time. Um, so I, I had some custom nipples made and then got a spoke machine that I could uh, roll the threads into 12 gauge spokes and also 13 gauge spokes, which are useful for the front wheels, 12 gauge spokes for the rear, made them to hub motors and make myself some custom electric motorcycle, electric bicycle, however you want to call it, some custom wheels for that particular niche, niche. And uh, it, it actually worked out. Other people said, hey, I like your wheels. I'll 
get some too. Originally, I got the machine just for myself to build my own wheels and to just have those that custom stuff that was exactly what I wanted. But it turned out in very short order that, hey, other people want it too, and the spoken machine, again, ended up paying for itself in relatively short order. Being a more expensive machine and fairly low cost per spoke, it took a long time to do, but it did. And it's still operating today, although it's really worn out and I'm about the only guy that can use it successfully. But we still have it and it's still useful. I just built a custom wheel set for myself just last week, which is pretty cool. Um, so moving on, we have that machine added to our list. Uh, around 2012, I started winding my own motors, I think 2011, maybe 2010 or so but I was mostly hiring out the labor with other companies doing the winding work for us. Um, a big part of that is balancing the armatures. You need a dynamic balancer to do it because it's long enough. You can't just do it as a single plane unless the rotor aspect ratio is really thin compared to the diameter. And our armatures are not like that for the electric motors. Uh, so I got a dynamic balancer. I bought it used off of uh, Checkpoint actually, or one of the old owners of Checkpoint. I bought a used dynamic balancer off of them, a Heinz, if you want to know the model. H-E-I-N-Z, I believe. I'd have to be in front of it. There's a couple different spellings of Heinz. Uh, but bought that guy and then started building my own equipment for motor winding. Uh, built my own power winder. I bought another power winder. Built my own vacuum chamber. Uh, bought a rotisserie oven for, uh, for baking the arms to get the resin impregnation right so it wouldn't be lopsided as far as the weight. And we turned it on a rotisserie. Uh, built another rotisserie and we've built even more of our own equipment as we're going along. The resistance brazier for doing the uh, the connection on the commutator. I bought one, I quickly destroyed it. I bought another one, I quickly destroyed it. And then I was looking at essentially a $15,000 machine just for the power stage to do what I wanted to do and have a little bit of overhead. It's like, man, $15,000. I that I'm not into paying that for a machine that I know that I could build a lot cheaper. Uh, so I essentially wound my own secondary transformer, used another primary transformer from a large welding machine, and then some electronics to control it. Then we have the, the welding head itself, and I cobbled that all together for, and instead of paying $15,000, I think I may have had like $1,000 in equipment, plus my own labor, which was quite considerable at that point in time. But you know, you do what you need to do to hit the price point that you need, and it worked out. It, it works, it's still in service today, and considering that I had destroyed multiple resistance brazier, well, they called them resistance brazers from some other motor, motor manufacturers, and they, they really weren't. They were nothing more than a soldering machine that would not output the current that we needed to long term, and they, they just fried, essentially they just would fry themselves. Um, so another machine added to the stable there and a machine that needs a lot of work to keep running, but I built it so I, I know how to keep it running. No big deal, right? Uh, but that's a big part of our manufacturing is, is these machines for the armatures that we produce these days and, and uh, really lucky to have come across the right parts at the right time and have the right knowledge to build that. Uh, so moving on in machines, uh, in 2012, right before I moved my business out of the house, I bought a TAG and converted it to CNC. Uh, the tag is a little bitty mill, you know, like, yeah, yay big, bigger than the Sherline was, but still, you know, small enough that I could move it around by hand, and then also good enough that I could use it for production work. The CNC really helped in that regard. Um, so what we did at first was, uh, and I've, I've got a bag of parts that I seem to have forgotten around here, but I made a lot of production, or I'm sorry, uh, prototype parts for the motors like the Puller Series, Puller 500, Puller 400, did a lot of prototype work on that, did a lot of modifying of uh, motor housings for customers that wanted custom work done, a um, lot of like flat plate work for myself, tooling, we make a lot of tooling on the machine, and that's majority of what the work is on the tag is tooling work. And, uh, but doing modified housings and doing some of the prototype work for the puller motors, it ended up paying for itself fairly quickly as well, you know, relatively quickly. We're not talking like five year payoff, we're talking about less than a year payoff, which is always good on a machine if you can pay it off in less than a year. Uh, still have it, still runs. Uh, I actually built that one from a kit to keep the cost down and so I would also understand how to uh, troubleshoot if anything went wrong. So I built the motor driver uh, PCBs up and uh, still runs today though. I uh, haven't really had to do a whole lot of work to it other than just kind of keeping the lead screws tight so the backlash doesn't get too much on the machine. So really like that machine, still have it around, still useful today. And uh, yeah, so moving on, next machine. Um, after that, I, I doubled, tripled down, went 10 times deep and I got a very large Mazak or Mazak machine 
is a, uh, let's see, how to describe it. Uh, it's a 250 MSY, essentially. Uh, so it has a throat on it. I got the bored out version, so it's got a three inch throat. So you can do bar feeding on a three inch. It would fit, uh, I believe, up to 15 inch. It, it would go larger, but essentially they called it like a 15 inch turning machine. Uh, had a, a very large chuck on the front, had a smaller backside. So the MSY stands for uh, essentially a, a dual lathe. So you have your, your front side lathe. And if you're doing bar feed work through the throat, then you can turn the, all the front side on the part. We had four live heads on it. So we could have four milling points. Um, I want to say it was three live heads in this direction and then one live head on the vertical direction to do the work. Plus all the other positions. It's a 12 position turret front and back. Uh, so you do the front side work and then you have the sub spindle. The sub spindle would move. We would grab it, do a bar feed pull, part it off and then go to the backside work. And then uh, all the tools on the backside would, would do what they need to do. And we had a bucket that would come up, spit out the part, essentially ready to go. I, uh, I built the machine up with the parts that we would need to do, parts that would spit out, essentially ready to go. Uh, we did a lot of drivetrain parts. I did puller housings in entirety there, face plates, uh, back iron, end bell, plus some assembly parts on the inside. Both prototype and production work on that. Uh, I had a contract for a couple of years with a, uh, and this was all through Homes Motion Control, mind you. This is a sister company to mine that's an engineering and machining company. Uh, so we were doing uh, motors for an aerospace company, doing a little electric motors for them for quite a few years. And uh, yeah, just having fun running the machine, doing drivetrain. Uh, let's see, it would be outputs for transmissions, uh, lockers for the axles, and uh, just made a lot of parts off of it. But when the contract was up for our uh, aerospace motors, I decided, you know, this is uh, it's a, another full-time job for me on top of running Holmes Hobbies and trying to do engineer for us. It was just a little too much. I was wearing myself thin, working way too much. I was not spending as much time with my family as I really felt that I needed to be doing, raising my kids. And I felt that Holmes Hobbies was just kind of starting to slip or that it would be slipping if I didn't do something about it. So I uh, sold the machine last year, 2017, and just kind of, you know, washed my hands of it. And that was, that was actually a good move because 2017 we had uh, some pressure on, put on us from Castle and everybody else wanting to get into the crawling market. And having to run that machine on top of Holmes Hobbies would have been extremely tough on the business. So it ended up being a really good move. I really miss having a production machine like that. They call it a turning center that just it spits out ready to go parts. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible feeling to go in the same day from a prototype idea to being able to run production and, and just, you know, being able to spit out a thousand or 10,000 parts on the machine with minimal work, you know, some tool changes when the end mill wear out or whatever, but just, uh, yeah, incredible feeling, incredible learning curve for that. I thought I was a machinist when I got the machine and uh, just a totally different situation to be able to do, you know, five parts or a hundred parts on one of my small machines versus doing a thousand or 10,000 on the big machine, just totally different realm. But I did it, I didn't go broke, and I'm still here today to be able to talk about it. So it was a positive on the whole. Uh, financial burden, huge financial burden, having a quarter million dollar machine on a five year payoff, but still I didn't go broke. I didn't have to go bankrupt because of it. And I would say that's a success, even though I didn't want to keep the machine long term, we still worked out in the long term for it. So yeah, we, uh, we don't have it anymore, but that was a pretty big milestone uh, having that in the company, one of my companies at least, and, and doing that. So uh, 2016, I started buying up little 3D printers. Uh, no, no big deal on the 3D printers, little cheap guys that I had to do a lot of work to get them out putting decent equipment. Uh, let's see, one of them is, uh, I don't even remember. They're, they're just kind of generic, no name type of stuff. Uh, uh, the name may come to me, but we uh, mostly use them for tooling. We do a couple of products like our little rubberized uh, cones. We do some, you know, in bell parts, rubberized in bell covers that, that uh, currently print instead of we, we made those parts on the machine as well. But that's, uh, yeah, that, that's mostly what I use it for as far as production is concerned, but we use it for tooling a whole bunch and prototyping a whole bunch. So it's kind of a behind the scenes sort of things. And then a lot of uh, things at my house. So I just set up a fish tank. I, I've been into fish tanks for a long time and I wanted to get a random flow nozzle on uh, one of my pump systems. And I could have made something or bought something, I'm sure, otherwise, but I just came up with the design that was a random flow generator. It's kind of like an accretor nozzle. I think that's how you say it, an accretor nozzle or accelerator nozzle. 
that's combined with uh, some veins in it. At any rate, ended up working out my first try out of the gate. Ended up making a really nice random flow nozzle, and it was like 13 cents in material and a you know a couple of hours of my time, which I could have just bought one for 20 bucks, but. I didn't want to wait a week uh, and you know my fish needed it at then and th then and now or whatever you want to call it and uh, i didn't i just didn't want to pay 20 bucks and i'm like you know i could do that myself so i got lucky uh, with the design i kind of know fluid dynamics enough to to hit it but uh, i got lucky with the design it, it right out of the gate the first one not that great in my opinion it still worked for random flow so that's the kind of stuff that i like working on just doing little household items and and also of course doing prototyping work for the business and little tooling it's really fun kind of gets to, to scratch my itch for manufacturing and it's, it's still a machine so i guess it's a, it's notable we have a lot of little other machines uh, around the shop that i don't really think are, are worth mentioning in this but that's kind of a history of my machines what i learned on and, and kind of who i am today as far as my skill sets oh uh have a tubing bender and also have like four or five welders that i've bought along the years really like welding to be able to do that uh, steel aluminum for the most part and uh, yeah, I guess I should mention those two. Uh, I mostly use a MIG, just a wire fed with sh uh, shielding gas because it's so easy. But what I can do on something, an object, I'll put it together, I'll just tack it in a couple of points, make sure it's all straight, and then go back on the TIG if I want a really good look to it or if I want to make sure that we get proper penetration and the, the MIG is just a one, uh, you know, little 120, so it doesn't have a whole lot of power. But I've always got that TIG to fall back on or break out the torch for that matter. Uh, so we got we got options we got options around the shop it's always good to have tools so uh yeah that that covers the main ones besides all the little you know die grinders and angle grinders and all that kind of crap so yeah i hope you uh, enjoyed a little bit of history on the machines of homes hobbies and what we do and what we make so yeah we'll just call it at that thanks for tuning in if you got more questions post them down below thanks for tuning in